Good evening, ladies. Good evening. Good evening. <laughs> well, welcome, welcome to Women's Bible Study. I'm so glad you guys are here. I'm going to start off with just a couple of announcements before we jump into God's Word tonight. So, um, just a, a reminder each week we take an offering. And the offering is basically to cover tech support, these beautiful books that we give out um, for each session, child care. Feel no obligation to give, but if you want to give, um, you can do it through their table there. I uh, want to make an announcement about baptism class. We have a baptism class that's coming up on Sunday, October 15th at 1 o'clock. So if you've made a commitment to faith, that's the next step in your faith walk. So I want to encourage you to come to the class, get some more information on what baptism is all about, um, and maybe have some of your questions answered there. There's a class that's being held through our uh, Thrive classes. It's called Beauty for Ashes. It's a supportive and safe group for women who know the pain of betrayal from a partner who struggles with pornography or other sexual addictions. So um, look on our website for more information for that class. And um, we still have hats for sale. If any of you, thank you. Stand up, show off that beautiful hat. Yeah, see what you're missing out on? If you don't have one of those hats, you're not cool. That's all I'm going to say. I don't know. <laughs> but the hats are $20, and we'd love for you to, to grab one. Um, you can get them before or after the talk. And last but not least, Gal Pal Week. We talked about this a little bit last week. Um, we're doing what we're calling a little bit of an invite night, uh, but we're doing Gal Pal Week. And we're encouraging you to invite your friends, neighbors, co-workers, those women in your life who maybe, you know, maybe they're not really interested in going to a Bible study or a church, but maybe they'll come to a Gal Pal Week and just kind of see what it's all about. So that's uh, the week of October 17th um, and 18th for Women's Bible Study. So that's it for the announcements. <laughs> Thank you, Sarah. <laughs> I tried to just plow right through it. Um, well, I want to just say another welcome, and especially for those who are joining us online. So glad you are with us tonight. Tonight we're going to be talking about books, uh, chapters 1 and 2 of Esther. When you think of the words, when you think of words like courage or bravery, what comes to mind for you? Is it someone who swims with great white sharks? Um, or maybe it's a friend who jumps out of planes for fun? Um, I don't get that. Um, or does it look like standing up for something that you believe, even if it costs you? Often we think courage means people are fearless. However, courage most often doesn't mean fearlessness. Nelson Mandela is quoted as saying, I learned that the brave one is not the one who does not feel afraid, but the one who conquers fear. As we read through chapters one and two of Esther's story, we'll focus on three acts of courage. And I want to talk about what courage looks like in our own lives. But before we do, let's pray. Hmm. Heavenly Father, we just thank you. Thank you that we have the opportunity to gather together as women and to share your word together. Thank you for what you will speak to our hearts tonight. Would you help us to be open, receptive, teachable, and humble, that we'll receive all that you have for us. Give us courage for whatever those next steps are that you have for us. And thank you for your grace and mercy being with us. I bless every woman in this space tonight, Father, that they would know their calling and they would know the true you, Lord. Thank you for all these things in Jesus' name, amen. So I recently read, I recently read something that talked about when Christians read the Bible, that we have a tendency 
to identify mostly with the positive heroines. But as we go through the book of Esther, I want to encourage you or even challenge you to see what you can glean or take away from all of those mentioned in this Bible story. In what ways do you recognize parts of your own stories in theirs? Are there lessons to be learned? And how might God be inviting you to reframe your thinking or perspective based on what we go through today? So last week we got an overview of the book of Esther and Jill did such a great job giving us some background. And one of the things that she said that I want us to keep top of mind as we go through these weeks is that our, our, the story that we're reading, the Esther story, is ultimately God's story. So today as we read about King Xerxes, Queen Vashti, Queen Esther, and Mordecai, let's keep in mind that their stories are part of God's story, and that we will hopefully see how God's plans for his people unfolds as we read through. Much of chapter one is setting kind of the backdrop for, the, for this book of, of Esther. And it's set in Persia. We're told that this is the third year of King Xerxes' reign. And he is the king of this powerful Persian empire. It's said that he's ruled, um, his scope of rulership spanned from what we would call India today to Ethiopia. Um, king Xerxes had a reputation for being cruel, exhibiting harsh punishments. And in a couple of commentaries I read, it said they called him a, a womanizer, thirsty for power, and someone that wasn't the best judge of character. So as we enter this story, so as we enter this story, we learn that King Xerxes has been throwing a six-month banquet. He's had this um, banquet going on for over 180 days where he's exhibited all of his wealth and power, and he's lavishing this, this mighty uh, party on all the noblemen and military leaders in the hopes of getting their support for a war he wants to wage on the Greeks. And at the end of this great campaign, I, I see it as kind of like a rap party for the six months of partying. Um, he starts off with um, inviting just everyone in his capital. So the first party was all the noblemen, all the military leaders, all of these you know, rulers. And then this last seven days, it's everyone in his capital. So it's his servants, it's his princes, it's the noble and statesmen within his own township. And during this time, this same seven day period, his, we're told his wife is throwing a party for the women. And on this last day of this festival, King Xerxes, who has been partying more than anyone should party probably, um, is high on wine and he summons for his queen to come to him. He wants to, he's been showing off all that he has all this time, and now he wants to show off this other, this last feather in his cap, which was his beautiful queen. So he invites her to come to his side of the party where all the men are, because he wants to parade her in front of his guest. So let's start reading in verse 10. It says, on the seventh day of the feast, when King Xerxes was in high spirits because of the wine, he told the seven eunuchs who attended him, me human, this, the, and the rest of the gang, <laughs> to bring Queen Vashti to him um, with the royal crown on her head. He wanted the nobles and all the other men to gaze on her beauty, for she was a very beautiful woman. But when they conveyed the king's order to Queen Vashti, she refused to come. This made the king furious, and he burned with anger. I'm going to jump to verse 15. What must be done to Queen Vashti, the king demanded? What penalty does the law provide a queen who refuses to obey the king's order properly sent through his eunuchs? Mimukin answered the king and his nobles, Queen Vashti was wronged, has wronged not only the king, 
but every noble and citizen throughout your empire. Jumping to verse 19. So if it pleases the king, we suggest that you issue a written decree, a law of the Persians and Medes that cannot be revoked. And this is a really important scripture. I'm going to say put a little pin in that scripture um, because this will come up later. I don't want to be a spoiler alert for upcoming talks, <laughs> but this will come in pretty, be pretty important point. It should, it should order that Queen Vashti be forever banished from the presence of King Xerxes and that the king should choose another queen more worthy than she. So I think something that's really important to, to mention or to point out, and because it's not really plainly stated in the scripture, is that when King Xerxes summoned Queen Vashti, um, he wasn't just summoning her to come and, you know, give that nice little royal wave to all the men and say hello. Um, he wanted her to come only in her crown. His, his call for her was to come and parade herself naked in front of the male guest. That request was not only undignified and highly disrespectful, it was also, it is also said to have gone against the strict Persian modesty laws. For him to request the queen to parade naked in front of a bunch of drunk men <laughs> was just the epitome of humiliation. Therefore, she refused his request. Which brings me to my first point. It takes courage to do what's right, even when it's unpopular and uncomfortable. It takes courage to do what's right, even when it's unpopular or uncomfortable. Whatever you might think about Queen Vashti's refusal to the king, you have to admit it took courage for her to say no. She had to have known that her refusal would come with some kind of consequence, especially such a public refusal. For most of us, our circumstances may not exactly be like Queen Vashti's. We may not be facing banishment or a death as a consequence, but can you recall a time in your life where you've taken a stand that came at a cost? Maybe it was when you shared your faith or religious beliefs, or when you stood up to a friend or family member that told an off collar joke that was not appropriate. Or maybe it's when you stood up, stood up for someone in the workplace because they were being mistreated or taken advantage of. In John 16, God's word says, I have told you all of this so that you may have peace in me. Here on earth, you will have many trials and sorrows, but take heart because I have overcome the world. I remember early on in my previous career in human resources, I had just, was a recent college grad and I had just kind of gotten this job and um, I'd worked for the company about a year before in temp roles and things like that. So I had a little friend group. A lot of us, we were all kind of, you know, new, recently out of college. And uh, we frequently go out to lunch together, kind of hang out. It was like a fun little peer group. So once I started in human resources, um, I was one of the first things that I was instructed in that job was the importance of keeping confidentiality. And um, I'm like, okay, fine. So I'm out to lunch with this group of friends, and, you know, in the past, we would go out, and we're all talking about whatever's happening in the company. Did you hear what happened to such and such? You know, no. And so they start talking about an issue that was going on with one of the executives in our company. And so they're all kind of going back and forth, and I'm quiet, and someone looks at me and says, Tanya, you're in HR. What's going on? And... I kind of froze because I didn't want them to think like, well, now that you're in HR, you can't talk with us or whatever, but I knew that I could not divulge because while they were speculating on what was going on, I actually knew what was going on. So I basically kind of hemmed and hawed and tried to kind of work around it, but 
ultimately said that I really couldn't discuss it. And, um, and there were some glances exchanged, um, and there were some, finally people just kind of like let it go. Um, however, the next time the girls got together for lunch, I wasn't invited. I know, right? <laughs> um, taking a stand sometimes comes with a cost or a consequence. It could be loss of influence or a friend group, or maybe it's even just the risk of being misunderstood. Joshua 1, 9 says, have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous, do not be frightened, and do not be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. How might the Lord be inviting you to take a stand in your life today? Let's continue reading, in, starting in chapter 2, verse 1. But after Xerxes' anger had subsided, he began thinking about Vashti and what she had done and the decree he had made. So his personal attendant suggested, let us search the empire to find beautiful young virgins for the king. Let the king appoint agents to each province to bring these beautiful young women into the royal harem at the fortress of Suga, Susa. Haggai, the king's eunuch, in charge of the harem, will see that they are all given beauty treatments. After that, the young woman who most pleased the king will be made queen instead of Vashti. This advice was very appealing to the king, so he put the plan into effect. At the time, there was a Jewish man in the fortress of Susa whose name was Mordecai. Mordecai was the son of Jair. He was from the tribe of Benjamin and was a descendant of Kaesh and Shimei. His family had been among those who, with King Jehoiakim of Judah, had been exiled from Jerusalem to Babylon by King Nebuchadnezzar. This man had a very beautiful and lovely cousin, Hadassah, who was also called Esther. When her father and mother died, Mordecai adopted her into his family and raised her as his own daughter. As a result of the king's decree, Esther, along with many other young women, was brought to the king's harem in the fortress of Susa and placed in Haggai's care. Haggai was very impressed with Esther and treated her kindly. He quickly ordered a special menu for her and provided her with beauty treatments. He also assigned her seven maids specially chosen from the king's palace, and he moved her and her maids into the best part of the harem. Esther had not told anyone of her nationality and family background because Mordecai had told her not to do so. So the second point is this. Courage has less to do with the absence of fear and more to do with our trust in God. Courage has less to do with the absence of fear and more to do with our trust in God. I read that it is thought that Esther might have been around 15 or so when she was actually first rounded up for the harem. And I can't even imagine the courage it must take for a young teenage Jewish girl who has been orphaned um, to be then taken away from the only family she knows and taken to the king's palace on the off chance that she might become queen. And more than likely, she would not become queen. She would just be part of his harem. And in being part of his harem, she wouldn't even, she may not ever have children. She could just live out her life there in the harem. So, um, and I'll, I'll, don't, let's not forget, she can't tell anyone that she's Jewish, right? And so her being taken off to the king's palace, it wasn't like The Bachelor, you know? It wasn't like she was choosing to like go and do this, I'm gonna marry a prince or whatever, you know? She was actually rounded up. She did not have a choice in the matter. Um, and it takes courage to be, to be vulnerable and to persevere in the face of this kind of uncertainty and the faith to step out of her comfort zone. 
and trust that God can help her do something hard. Where might be God inviting you to be vulnerable? Is he inviting you out of what's comfortable for his purposes? I'm not saying that Esther's life was an easy life, and I'm not saying up to that point everything was going smoothly for her, but there had to be some sense of comfort that she was at least with her family. She was at least with family. Having to leave all of that after she had lost so much already um, had to be traumatizing. I'm sure all that she had learned about God up to that point is what she clung on to. But she even had to be careful about revealing her faith or that she, her Jewish heritage. When all seems lost, to whom do you cling? Do you trust God? Isaiah 26.3 says, you keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts you. Trusting God in the face of things that are coming our way, fears, is the only way we get through them. Our God says that he would never fail you or abandon you, and you can be courageous because you can put your trust in him. Let's pick it up in verse 16. Esther was taken to King Xerxes at the royal palace in early winter of the seventh year of his reign. And I think it's interesting because, you know, Jill told us last, last week that this is over a 10-year span. So when Vashti was, you know, deposed, when she lost her crown, that was in the third year of his reign. Now we're in the seventh year of his reign. So it's four years in the middle of... Esther getting to even come before the king at the possibility of becoming queen. And the king loved Esther more than any of the other young women. He was so delighted with her that he set the royal crown on her head and declared her queen instead of Vashti. To celebrate the occasion, he gave a great banquet in Esther's honor for all his nobles and officials declaring a public holiday for the provinces and giving generous gifts to everyone. Even after all the young women had been transferred to the second harem and Mordecai had become a palace official, Esther continued to keep her family background a secret. She was still following Mordecai's directions just as she did when she lived in his home. One day as Mordecai was on duty at the king's gate, Two of the king's eunuchs, Bigthana and Teresh, who were guards at the door of the king's private quarters, became angry at King Xerxes and plotted to assassinate him. But Mordecai heard about the plot and gave the information to Queen Esther. She then told the king about it and gave Mordecai credit for the report. When an investigation was made and Mordecai's story was found to be true, the two men were impaled on a sharp pole. This was all recorded in the book of in, this was all recorded in the book of the history of King Xerxes' reign. You know, it couldn't have been easy for Mordecai to turn Esther over to the uh, um, to the guards who who came and gathered her. You know, he had taken her in as a young daughter, or for Esther, young Esther, to leave the only family she knew to trust these strangers in the Persian palace. And it probably wasn't easy for Mordecai to put himself in harm's way and get involved with the report, that, uh, and to get involved and report the guard's plan and um, strategy to assassinate the king. But they all did it. Which brings me to my final point. A courageous decision isn't always an easy decision. A courageous decision isn't always an easy decision. I was hesitant to share this story um, that happened about 25 or 30 years ago. Um, I was heading to church on a Saturday night 
Um, it was about 6.30 in the evening, and um, it was late fall, so it was already dark at that time. And I was driving down Pico and heading, um, I was driving down La Brea, turned west onto Pico, and about, just as I turned off the road, about a half a block ahead of me, I saw a car pull over and three or four men jumped out of the car with guns. They started shooting at this kid that was running across the street right, right in front of my car. It was a really like, it was a surreal moment. It was like, what is this? And I felt like time had just stopped. Um, I didn't really know what to do. And uh, the crazy thing is that if you know that area of LA, it's a busy street, but my car was the only car in that section right there. So before I could even figure out what to do, the kid had gotten to the side of my car and he was banging on my window um, to help him or something, you know. Um, but I didn't want to let him in my car. <laughs> I was scared, you know. And, um, but, it must have been the Lord. I, I unlocked the car door, and he hopped into the back seat, and he had been shot in the leg. <clears throat> so by this time, I don't know, I lost focus on what was happening with the guys that were shooting, but they had gotten back in their car, they drove off, and I was about a couple of blocks away from the church I was attending at that time, and so I ended up going and asking someone to accompany me while I took him to a hospital that was nearby. Um, he ended up being, he was okay. Um, he wasn't in a gang, he was a young kid, like 14 years old. Uh, just wrong place, wrong time. I tell this story because I didn't feel courageous. And many people told me that what I did was stupid. <laughs> <laughs> and in the moment, I felt scared and I was kind of mad because I was like, why are you putting me in this situation? Um, however, I know it was really only the Lord that helped me to do something I was too afraid to do on my own. I didn't want to get involved. I didn't want to be a part of it. I don't know these people. I don't know what's going on here. But when I looked at that kid's face, I was compelled to help. I read somewhere that acts of courage takes action. Psalms 23, verse 4a says, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. God is with us. So I want to ask you the same question I started with. When you, think of, when you think of words of courage, words like courage or bravery, what comes to mind for you? How will you respond? Can we just take a moment to quiet ourselves before the Lord, whatever posture is comfortable for you, and let's just ask the Lord. As we've talked about courage tonight, is there any action God is bringing to your attention? Many times, um, Courage is something that happens unexpectedly. <laughs> you don't know when it's going to happen, when you're going to have to be in that situation. But I think just remembering that you are never on your own as a Christ follower, that God is with you, is helpful. So what I like to pray now is just as if God's bringing anything to your attention or whatever he puts on your heart, I just love to pray and ask for his help and guidance as we pray. Thank you, Lord. Mm. 
Thank you, Lord. Um, <laughs> Heavenly Father, you, we can't be courageous if there's no fear. <laughs> but your perfect love cast out fear. So even though we may step into situations and may not always know what to do or how to handle them, thank you for speaking to our hearts at those times. Thank you for the knowledge of knowing that we are never on our own and that we can trust your hand to nudge and guide us. Help us, Lord God, to be sensitive to those times when you are telling us to stand up when you're telling us to get out of our comfort zone, when you're telling us, Lord God, to trust you over what we see and how we feel. We just commit to you, Lord God, our hearts. We thank you for your plans and your hand in our life. Thank you that we will forever, forever be reminded of all that you've done for us already. You've already done the ultimate sacrifice for us, Father. So if you've brought us this far, you didn't bring us this far to leave us. <laughs> so thank you for your faithfulness, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.